गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन अगेन फ्रेश मंडे सिक्स थर्टी एंड विद न्यू टॉपिक हाउ वी विल मैनेज एंड हाउ वी विल अप्रोच अ पेशेंट विद न्यूरोलॉजिकल डेफिसिट इन पैलेटिव केयर सेटिंग्स एंड फॉर दिस दिस टॉपिक वी हैव अ वेरी गुड टीम फ्रॉम कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट अडिया चेन्नई uh dr minakshi uh, will moderate and definitely there will be lot of learning from today and jennifer will speak i request dr kalpana kindly introduce uh, speaker and moderator and then we can start thank you good morning everyone uh, i am uh, i am so glad to have uh, this topic assigned for cancer institute uh, we have uh, with us uh, our associate professor dr meenakshi a very committed uh, palliative care physician though she started as an anesthetist and uh, she is very ev evidence based uh, physician who is working at the helen and calcy institute uh, and we have a very uh, uh, you know enthusiastic um, post graduate dr jeffrila uh, and they'll be uh, going through the topic of uh, uh, managing a patient with uh, coming to the hospital with uh, uh neurological weakness in palliative care settings uh over to dr minakshi uh thank you ma'am for the kind words uh, uh, dr jeffrila has uh, been with us uh, at the cancer institute uh, uh, just uh, over about 10 months now uh and uh, she is a, a very quiet person actually uh, but very careful and methodical in her work and uh, today's session we have strived to um present a Uh, purely clinical and swift method to evaluate a patient with uh, neurological symptoms and we hope you enjoy this session as much as we did while preparing for it uh, thank you and over to you uh, nancy good luck so good morning to everyone uh, the topic for our discussion today is approach to a patient presenting with neurological weakness in a palliative care setting so we'll be discussing under these headings Uh, neurological symptom burden in palliative care definition of neurological weakness some relevant neuroanatomy evaluating a patient with neurological symptoms followed by upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron lesions so neurological diseases and symptoms are frequently seen in palliative care patients and it is associated with a high symptom burden out of the palliative care patients with ne these neurological symptoms it was found that 48% had a underlying non neurological illness in india the contribution of non infectious neurological diseases to a total dis uh, disability adjusted life years has been in the rise in the past 20 years as for the definition of neurological weakness it is an actual loss of muscle strength that reduces or prevents the ability to do regular movements that is uh, the patient will have a functional limitation for a little bit about uh, the relevant neuroanatomy the sensations that we feel in our body are sent via the sensory pathway to our brain to perceive it and if we re require a muscle movement the sense uh, the signals are sent from the motor cortex via the descending pathway for us to perform that motion so with this uh, we'll be discussing about the descending pathway or the motor pathway out of which the prime importance is of the uh, pyramidal tract or the corticospinal tract so uh, the corticospinal tract is formed by uh, mainly by the pyramidal cells of the motor area and these fibers run through the posterior limb of the internal capsule down to the midbrain pons and then to the medulla oblongata at the lower end of the medulla oblongata 80% of these fibers cross over to the opposite side Uh, to form the lateral corticospinal tract whereas 15% of the five sorry 20 percent, uh, 15% of the fibers enter the anterior corticospinal uh, tract at the same side and they cross over at the corresponding spinal segments whereas 5% of corticospinal fibers uh, supply muscles of the same side example the neck muscle that have bilateral control so the meaning is the left side of the pyramidal tract and controls the right half of the body next we'll be discussing about the sensory pathway or the ascending pathway uh, 
we'll be discussing about the spinothalamic tract and the dorsal column for the la uh, lateral uh, first is the lateral spinothalamic tract this carries pain and temperature sensations via the nociceptors and the thermal receptor the first order neuron is in the uh, dorsal root ganglion which synapses with neurons in the laminae 2 and laminae 3 the pain sensation is especially perceived in laminate 2 substantia gelatinosa and the sensation of pain and temperature from the right side crossover at the same level to the left side and they are carried via the uh, lateral spinothalamic tract and they synapse with the third order neuron in the posteroventral nucleus in thalamus. Next is the anterior spinothalamic uh, tract which carries sensation of two touch, pressure, tickle and itch. The first order neuron is also in the dorsal root ganglion and the relay is in the posterior horn nucleus or the nucleus popliteus, laminate three and four. Uh, these uh, second order uh, neurons then ascend up to about one or two segments and then cross over to the left side and form the anterior spinothalamic tract and they synapse with the posteroventral nucleus of thalamus. For the dorsal root ganglion, uh, the mechanoreceptors in the skin, which include Merkel cells, Mises corpuscles, Ruffini endings, and Fessinian corpuscles, tend to uh, stimulate, uh, be stimulated by uh, sensations of proprioception and vibration via uh, the two tracts that are present. One is the tract of Gaul and next is the uh, tract of Burdak. So this tract of Gaul, the important thing is to note that uh, the tract of Gaul starts in the caudal end of the spinal cord. Uh, and hence, these sensations of proprioception and vibration from the lower limb are perceived via these uh, tract of Gaul, whereas the tract of Burdak starts in the mid-thoracic area. Uh, and hence, the upper limb sensations of proprioception and vibration are carried via this tract of Burdak. So let's have a case scenario and we would like your active participation in this. So this is a 33-year-old with neck pain and numbness in the right upper and lower limb for two days and there's weakness and spasticity in left upper limb and lower limb. There's reduced sensation of pain and temperature in right upper and lower limbs. And there's reduced the sensation to vibration and position in left upper and lower limb. So there is a uh, one-sided uh, involvement of the spinothalamic tract and one-sided involvement of the uh, dorsal root gang, uh, dorsal root. So column, where do you think is the lesion of the patient? What is the level of the lesion of the patient? Can someone, sorry. You can type in the chat box or unmute yourself. Uh, no chats coming up, maybe. Uh... Hmm. You could go on in the interest of time. Yeah, there's one chat right now. Yeah. Spinothalamic tract, says Dr. Ravi Kiran. The lesion uh, is in the spinothalamic tract. Okay. Uh, so since both the upper and the lower extremities are involved, the level of the lesion should be uh, above uh, in the upper thoracic or the cervical segment. And it's a cervical lesion. And uh, if we uh, look at the involvement of the spinothalamic tract, uh, the patient has a brown sequard syndrome. That is, in brown sequard syndrome, there will be involvement of spinothalamic tract on the contralateral side and involvement of uh, dorsal column in the ipsilateral side. And she uh, has a left-sided lesion in the cervical spinal cord at the level of C3 to C4. So, conus medullaris, uh, conus medullaris versus corda equina, the spinal cord uh, in our body ends at the anatomical level of L1 to L2. 
though the meninges extend uh, downwards till the level of L5 to S1. Uh, the corda equina is a lumbosacral uh, group of uh, nerves that uh, resemble the horse's tail. So now we'll move on to evaluating a patient with a neurological weakness. <clears throat> First, we will be eliciting the history, followed by doing a physical examination, then localizing the lesion and coming at a differential diagnosis. For the history, the temporal cause of illness is noted. That is, if a patient has an acute weakness, which has occurred over a, uh, one hour or uh, in a hour, two days, it is suggestive of a vascular etiology like stroke. Whereas if it is subacute in onset, which has occurred over a weeks to months, it is chronic inflammatory in pathology. And if it's a, a chronic uh, pathology, which has occurred over a period of months to years, it is suggestive of degenerative condition or tumors. So if there is a uh, remission or regress regression present, it is suggestive of ischemia. If there's relapsing and remitting involving different levels of nervous system, system it is multiple sclerosis. And if it's low, slowly progressive without any remission, it is neuro, either new, neurodegenerative or neoplasm. So ability to do task is also assessed in a patient. We should ask the patient uh, what they are having difficulty in doing. Like if, if for example, the patient says they are having difficulty in brushing or combing, then it is suggestive of proximal weakness of the upper limb. If they're having difficulty with the buttoning or opening the bottle, it is suggestive of a distal weakness of the upper limb. So also factors that are worsening weakness are, is elicited. Uh, if heat and humidity worsens weakness, it is suggestive of multiple sclerosis, whereas repetitive use of muscles, that is fatigability, is a class of findings in pyasthenia gravis. Also other associated symptoms are of importance uh, while we are coming, uh, coming at a differential diagnosis at the end. So uh, sensory changes, double vision, memory loss, aphasia, seizures, and headaches are also elicited during the history. For example, if a patient presents with associated symptom of anorexia and weight loss, it is suggestive of cancer or any other uh, chronic illness. Family in, in, uh, history is also important uh, in these patients because uh, certain Mendelian disorders like, like Huntington's present uh, in the family uh, polygenic disorders like uh, multiple sclerosis are also noted in the family. And familial propensity to hypertension and heart disease is relevant in a patient presenting with stroke. So for the medical illness, uh, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and atrial fibrillation are conditions that predispose a patient to uh, throw a thrombus and uh, the cerebrovas uh, cerebrovascular disease and the underlying disease cancers can metastasize and malignancies can present with neurological paraneoplastic syndromes or complications of chemo and radiotherapy. So now let, let's look at a case with just the history if we are able to come at a diagnosis. So this is a 65 year old uh, suddenly presenting with develop, uh, uh, slurred speech, right-sided weakness, history of hypertension is present, diabetes and atrial fibrillation is present. This is a BP pulse rate of the patient and the irregular rhythm is also present. So uh, it is a sudden onset illness with a history of hypertension, diabetes and atrial fibrillation. What do you think is the diagnosis for the patient? Nothing in the chat as yet. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Intracranial bleed, ischemic stroke, stroke, cerebrovascular accident or thrombotic event. Yeah. We can go yes, on now. Uh, it is an acute ischemic stroke in this person. In this case, it is an occlusion of the left uh, middle cerebral artery. So now let's move on to the physical examination of the uh, 
patient presenting with a neurological weakness, we will be examining uh, in this order. All these examinations are a bare minimum. If we find any abnormalities in this, we have to evaluate the uh, patient further. So first is the higher mental functions. Once we come to a patient for evaluating the higher mental functions, we should first assess the Glasgow Coma Scale. So uh, as we all know, Glasgow Coma Scale has three components, the motor response, verbal response, and eye opening. It is scored from uh, the minimum score is 3 and maximum score is 15. If the patient has a score between 13 to 15, it is a mild traumatic brain injury. If the score is between uh, 9 to 12, it's a moderate traumatic brain injury. And if it's a score between 3 to 8, it's a severe traumatic brain injury. Next, we, uh, what we see is the orientation of the patient. Four things in orientation is checked. Uh, orientation to person, place, time, as well as situation. Next is the speech. Speech need not be assessed as a separate entity. We can uh, check for speech during the entire uh, this, uh, session like we are having with the patient. In speech, we have to note the rate of speech, volume, quantity, fluency, and tone. Next is the Minicog or the MMSC examination. So Minicog is the quickest and the simplest way to assess higher mental function, which involves three steps. First is the three word recognition. We tell the patient three words in their language of understanding, which are unrelated, and ask the patient to repeat it, repeat, uh, repeat it to us so that it is registered. There is no um, uh, scoring for step one. Whereas for step two, uh, clock drawing, we ask the patient to draw a clock. If the patient is able to draw a circle and number it accordingly, he or she will be given a score of one. Then we tell a time like uh, 1130. And if the patient is able to draw the minute and the hour hands at the right place, uh, he or she will be given a scoring of one. And in the step three, three word recall if the uh, for every word the patient is able to recall he or she will be given a score of one so the maximum score in minicog is five and minimum is zero by minicog is because minicog had uh, has a high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing dementia in community dwelling older adults so uh, if we find any abnormality in Minicog examination, then we can move on to the mini mental status examination, which is a much more elaborate examination. The orientation is checked in an elaborate manner. Uh, calculation skills are checked in the patient. Naming objects, that is anomia, can be checked. Uh, complex diagrams, agraphia can be checked. Uh, the abstract thinking will be checked and hence the uh, total scoring in this patient will be 30. If the score is between 20 to 25, it is a suggestive of mild cognitive impairment. 10 to 20 is suggestive of a moderate cognitive impairment and 0 to 10 is suggestive of severe cognitive impairment in patients with NMRT. So we are done with the higher mental functions. Now we will move on to cranial nerve examination. As we all know, we have 12 cranial nerves. Uh, at the end of the cranial nerves, we'll be uh, seeing a short video uh, to explain the cranial nerves. So first is the olfactory nerve. For smell, we can use as simple as an alcohol swab that is available. Uh, next is the ophthalmic nerve. In ophthalmic nerve, two things we have to check. One is the visual field examination. Next is the visual acuity. Uh, for visual acuity, we can use a smell lens chart. For cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6, uh, the oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, and abducens nerve, which are responsible for the extraocular eye movements. We ask the patient to, uh, uh, we sit at, the examiner sits at the eye level of the patient, and with the pointed finger, we should move in the fashion of the alphabet H, so that we can assess or uh, we should uh, ask the patient not to move the neck and follow our. Uh, pointed finger with just eyeball movements. This assesses the six extraocular uh, muscles in our eye. Next is the tri uh, trigeminal nerve and uh, facial nerve. For this, uh, both uh, cranial, uh, sorry, uh, sensory as well as motor part is present. 
for the uh, motor part for the upper half of the face we can ask the patient to uh, raise the eyebrows and uh, tightly close their eyes to check for symmetry and for the lower half of the face we can ask the patient to do puff, puffing of the cheeks and uh, a wide smile to also check for symmetry and for the motor part of the examination trigeminal nerve has uh, three parts v1 v2 and v3 these uh, segments tend to taper off at the lateral side and hence the point to notice while we are examining the sensations in these components uh, for light touch we should uh, do it in the medial part so for vestibular cochlear nerve uh, hearing is tested uh, webers and ringgit test is uh, used for uh, assessing vestibular cochlear function using a tuning fork for the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve uh, elevation of palate we ask the patient to say ah and uh, check if the palate is symmetrically elevated uh, for spinal accessory nerve we should ask the patient to shrug the shoulder and uh, check for uh, with resistance <coughs> uh for hypoglossal nerve we ask the patient to protrude their tongue and uh, give the maximum lateral movements to check for the hypoglossal so this uh, i'll be playing a short video for cranial nerve assessment um dr jeffrila can you pause yes the... sir oh, one second yeah. yeah yes sir so when you um, do new share just click on new share Okay. At the bottom left screen, there is share sound. Okay. Please tick that. Okay. Yeah, now you can play the video. All right, I'm going to assess your cranial nerves now. Um, I have something here. I want you to smell that. What do you smell there? Alcohol. Okay. All right, look straight here at my nose, and I want you to tell me how many fingers you see in total. Three. Good. And now? Five. Okay. All right, now look straight here at the tip of my finger. Follow it uh, with your eyes only and try to keep your head steady. Look all the way over here. Good. I have this um, eye card here. I want you to hold it with one hand and cover your left eye for me. Now, uh, read me the smallest line that you can read. Nine, three, seven, eight, two, six. Okay. Now switch eyes for me. Okay. And read me the smallest <laughs> line you can read. Four, two, eight, three, six, five. Okay. All right. All right. I want you to close your eyes as tight as you can. Open them up widely. Good. Give me a big smile. Okay. Can you feel me touching your face here? Yes. Does it feel about the same on both sides? Yes. Okay. Can you hear this over here? Mm -hmm. And can you hear this over here? Yes. Is it about the same on both sides? Mm -hmm. Okay. Open your mouth and say ah for me. Ah. Stick your tongue all the way out and move it side to side. Okay. All right. And shrug your shoulders up like this. Okay. All right. And there's your 12 cranial nerves. So we've discussed about the higher cranial functions, the cranial nerves, and now is the motor examination. So for motor examination, two things are assessed. One is the tone, and next is the strength. So for tone, uh, tone is defined as the passive range of movement of, around a joint. The tone can either be uh, increased or decreased. If there's increased tone, this, uh, it can be either rigidity or spasticity. Rigidity is otherwise uh, a lead pipe in nature, like it is velocity independent. How much ever <coughs> increase on decrease in velocity, it cannot be resistance, resistance cannot be broken. Whereas spasticity is velocity dependent. It is like a knife in a pocket. With the decreased uh, velocity, resistance can be broken. For uh, tone, if there's a decreased tone, it, uh, it is uh, termed as uh, flaccid. For strength of the muscle, is uh, defined as a maximum contractile force that is uh, required against resistance. 
while assessing the muscle strength for the upper extremities deltoids biceps triceps and intrinsic group and uh, intrinsic muscles and group is assessed for lower extremities iliopsoas quadriceps tibialis anterior and gastrocnemius are all checked for example if we're going to check the uh, a muscle uh, strength grading we're going to check for the biceps uh, muscle strength we ask the patient to perform the full range of movement uh, that is to entirely flex the elbow and then apply resistance for checking uh, if a uh, patient is able to withstand against full strength it is given a score of 5 only against moderate strength it is given a score of 4 if the patient is only able to perform the full range of motion against uh, gravity but uh, uh, resistance the uh, it, the arm falls off then it is given a score of 3 and if a patient is able to do the range of motion only when the force of gravity is eliminated it is given a score of 2 and this flicker a uh, flicker of muscles is uh, given a score of 1 and uh, no muscle contraction is given a score of 0 so the sensory part of the examination uh, as we all discussed previously pain and temperature is carried via the spinothalamic uh, lateral spinothalamic tract and the well, vibration and proprioception is carried via the dorsal column so if uh, if you are going to assess for sensation since these both sensation are carried via the same fibers uh, assessing for uh, either one is uh, sufficient if we find any abnormalities we can go to a much uh, elaborate examination uh, the point to be noted is that for, while uh, checking for proprioception we have to uh, choose the distal most uh, joint for example in the upper limb we can choose the uh, distal interphalangeal joint we should Uh, immobilize the distal interphalangeal joint with our fingers, and then ask to uh, move the distal phalange up or down to check for joint positioning. For vibration, we have to use a tuning fork, and uh, for pain and temperature, for pain we can use the uh, uh, reflex hammer's uh, sharp edge. The important thing is that uh, in sensory examination, right versus left is checked. proximal versus distal is also also checked and compared for the reflexes uh, we should use a, a reflex hammer to check in these patients normal reflex would be uh, or given a score of 2 if it's a diminished reflex hyperreflexia is given a score of 1 and absent reflex is given a score of 0 whereas exaggerated reflex or disc reflex is given a score of 3 clonus or hyperreflexia is given a score of 4 so <clears throat> this is a schematic diagram that represents the reflexes biceps reflex is checked triceps reflex is checked brachioradialis patella and achilles uh, reflexes are checked and the scoring is uh, given in the schematic diagram of like this for an easier representation So next is the coordination examination. For the upper limb coordination, we use the finger-to-finger -finger test. Uh, the examiner sits at the level of the patient. The important thing to note in this is that uh, the examiner pointer finger should be at arm's length from the patient, so that the patient has to stretch the entire arm uh, to touch the finger. So for the lower limb, it is the heel to shin test. Next is the gait examination. in this we'll be assessing uh, two gait one is the unstressed gait which is we ask the patient to walk from one point to another like he or she normally does and in tandem gait we should ask the patient to walk in this manner uh, heel to toe for romberg sign this uh, is elicited mainly for cerebellar lesions uh, generally for the sense of balance we require three things one is the vision cerebellum and next is the vestibular apparatus in the ear if uh, one thing uh, is eliminated that is if we ask the patient to close their eyes if there is either a cerebellar pathology or vestibular pathology the patient uh, tends to lose balance and fall which will be a uh, positive romberg sign in this we'll be discussing about the hemiplegic gait and the ataxic gait hemiplegic gait is when a patient folds his or her arm to one side and then drags his or her feet in a uh, circumductive fashion 
that is in a semicircular fashion. This is also called as a circumduction gate. As ataxic gate is seen in cerebellar diseases. This is uh, described as a clumsy gate or a drunkard's gate. The patient will be having difficulty to walk in a straight line. So let's, uh, we are done with the physical examination and now let's move on to localizing the lesion in the uh, nervous system. It can be either a upper motor neuron pathology or a lower motor neuron pathology. If it's upper motor, it can be either a cerebral cortex, subcortical area, brainstem, cerebellum or spinal cord. If it's a lower motor neuron, it can be either anterior horn cell, root, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction or muscle. We'll be discussing one by one. So first is the cerebral cortex lesion. If uh, specifically the lesion is in the frontal lobe, the patient will be having difficulty in uh, emotion, emotion and impulse control. Personality changes will be present. If Broca's area is affected, patient will be having non-fluent aphasia. That is, uh, patient will be able to comprehend what is being told to them, but they'll be having difficulty communicating. Whereas a uh, temporal lobe lesion, patient will be having this disturbances in hearing, memory and learning. And uh, if Wernicke's area is involved, patient will be having difficulty in understanding the language and uh, speech. That is, they'll be having a fluent aphasia. Comprehension will be affected in these patients. Whereas parietal lobe lesion, patient will be having difficulty in coordinating sensory information like uh, pain, touch, and also special uh, features like anomia, which is also uh, called as uh, they'll be having difficulty in naming objects, uh, agraphia, difficulty in writing, uh, a alex alexia will be present. Uh, then dyscalculia will be present. Patient will be having difficulty in doing uh, mathematical calc simple mathematical calculation. Learned and acquired skills that the patient uh, they'll be having difficulty in performing them. Occipital lobe lesion patient will be having uh, cortical blindness. That is, uh, the patient will be able to see everything normally, but uh, it will not be perceived in the occipital lobe. So this is a homunculus. On the left is the somatosensory cortex and right is the somatomotor cortex. If the patient is having a um, motor cortex lesion, there will be an abnormal mental status examination or cognitive impairment will be present. And non-specific symptoms like loss of consciousness and seizures may be present. And the weakness in this patients will be facio-brachial predominant. As we can see, the homunculus, uh, most of the part of the cortex is occupied by the face and the upper limb. So now let's see a scenario. Uh, this is a 72-year-old woman with right hemiparesis. And uh, she is having difficulty finding words and understanding speech. There is fluent aphasia is present, anomia, alexia is present, and agraphia is present. So with the knowledge we have discussed in the cerebral cortex lesion, what, what is the lesion? Uh, where do you think is the lobe, uh, lobe involved? Uh, nothing the, so far coming up. Can we move on? Now? Uh, yeah, perhaps you could just decode it and then go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, since fluent aphasia is present, there's involvement of the uh, parietal, so temporal lobe and anomia, alexia, and agraphia are so of parietal lobe lesion. Since there's right hemiparesis, there's involvement of left uh, upper uh, motor neuron. So this patient had a left temporal and parietal lobe uh, stroke. So next, moving on to the subcortical area. If an isolated small lesion is present in the subcortical area, say about one centimeter, if coronary radiator is involved, only few fibers will be involved and the weakness will be mild in nature. Whereas internal capsule patient will be having dense weakness. In thalamus, uh, 
the patient will be having sensory fluctuation and basal ganglia. Extrapyramidal symptoms like rigidity, tremor, dystonia, and chorea will be present. So, with this in mind, we will be having a, another case, a uh, 54 year old with sudden onset numbness and tingling in hand and mouth. There is a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And there's a reduced sensation, particularly to the uh, thero oral uh, distribution and affecting the right hand and right side of the mouth. So, uh, where is the lesion in this patient? The weakness is specified to a small part of the body. So, in, in the interest of time, we'll just move on. Uh, mild weakness is suggestive of a corona radiator lesion. And since the right side of the hand and mouth is involved, it is suggestive of a left-sided pathology. So, okay, left corona radiator is involved. So next is a brainstem. A brainstem comprises of the midbrain, pons, and medulla. The cranial nerves are involved in the brainstem. There will be ipsilateral cranial nerve involvement uh, in, in, the, in these structures. And there will be contralateral hemiplegia present in the brainstem. According to which part is involved, uh, that particular cranial nerve will be affected. In medulla, there will be an extra bulbar palsy will be present in the patient. In cerebral lesion, patient will be having dysarthria, vertigo will be present, balance, balance or gait disturbances, that is ataxy gait will be present, diplopia, slurred speech, tremors, and loss of ability to coordinate fine movements will also be present in these patients. So, uh, this is a case scenario of a 56-year-old woman with difficulty in walking and keeping her balance, slurred speech is present, blurring of vision is present, history of Breast cancer and uh, patient is on chemotherapy, ataxia is present, dysarthria and misdiagnosis is present. So, where is the lesion in this patient? <clears throat> Since there is uh, ataxia, dysarthria, blurring of vision is present, patient, the main thing to note is that. Yes, uh, it's a cerebellar pathology. So next is the spinal cord lesion. Patient will present with back pain and tenderness and there'll be bilateral weakness or sensory abnormality, sparing the head and there'll be mixed upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron features. Also sphincter dysfunction will be present. So now we are done with the upper motor neuron pathologies. We'll move on to the lower motor neuron pathologies. First is the anterior horn cell. Uh, in example, um, amelotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis, a patient will present with the pure motor uh, weakness. There'll be no sensory loss present. Uh, wasting will be present, fasciculations will be present, reflexes will be lost, and the spread will be in the leg arm bulbar fashion or from the bulbar arm and leg fashion. If the root is involved, patient will have a radicular pain. Uh, root involvement is a classic finding in intervertebral disc herniations. The weakness will be in the myotomal distribution and sensory abnormalities will be seen in the dermatomes. Also, there will be loss of reflexes present. So, this is the dermatomal re representation of our body. Uh, dermatome is defined as area of skin whose uh, sensory distribution is innervated by a single spinal nerve. And this is the myotomal distribution, uh, a group of muscles which are innervated by a single uh, spinal nerve group is called as a myotome. So this is a 45-year-old man with a lower back pain with right leg pain for about three months. This pain started after lifting heavy box at work. And the pain is the sharp shooting electric like worsening with coughing, sneezing and bending forward. Numbness is present in tingling in the right calf and foot. And this reduce, reduce the sensation to light touch and pinprick in the right left uh, L5 and uh, S1 dermatomes. And there's weakness in ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So where is the pathology in this patient?
since there's weakness in the ankle dorsiflexion, the involvement is in the S1. Also, the clue itself is here in the L5 and S1 dermatome is involved. This is actually a lumbar radiculopathy with this herniation at L5 and S1. So, next is the uh, plexus. Plexus can be either involved in hematomas, injuries, or in tumors compressing the plexus, and the weakness in these patients will be asymmetrical. It, both proximal and distal part will be involved. Both sensory and motor disturbances will be present in these patients. Next is the peripheral nerve. Uh, peripheral nerve is involvement is a distal predominant, uh, that is, in a glavin stocking pattern will be present. Sensory and motor loss will be present along the single peripheral nerve distribution. Weakness will be in the lower motor neuron fashion. Loss of reflexes with or without pacing will be present. Neuromuscular junction uh, diseases uh, like uh, myasthenia graves patient will be having uh, fatigability. Uh, weakness in the proximal and symmetric uh, in patient autonomic function will be intact in these patients. Whereas uh, muscle involvement in uh, uh, myopathy is patient be having a classic uh, proximal weakness with symmetrical involvement. Pure motor uh, involvement will be present as well reflexes with myalgia, whereas the sensation and autonomic functions will be intact. So this is a 68-year-old uh, with a history of diabetes, type 2 diabetes mellitus for 15 years. There's pain, a burning pain and a numbness in feet. Poor glycemic control is present. Reduced sensation to light, touch, pinprick, vibration. Temperature in a uh, stocking distribution is present. Absent ankle reflexes and mild weakness of the toe dorsiflexion is present. So, uh, where, where is, uh, what is the diagnosis in this patient? So, uh, since we are lack of time, we'll just move on. Uh, this is a peripheral neuropathy. To be specific, it's a diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So now we'll be discussing the difference between ponus medullaris and cauda equina. Uh, ponus medullaris, the vertebral level is at L1 to L2, and it is basically the sacral cord segment of the spinal cord. Whereas cauda equina, the vertebral level inward is anywhere between L2 to sacrum, and uh, the lumbosacral nerve roots are involved in this. For conus medullaris, the patient presents with a sudden bilateral uh, lower back pain, whereas for cauda equina, patients will have a gradual unilateral, more of a uh, radicular pain. Motor strength in conus medullaris, patient will be having symmetrical motor weakness, less marked hyperreflexia will be present, and distal paralysis will be present with fasciculations. As for cauda equina, uh, there will be marked asymmetric reflexive refle paraplegia and atrophia. Atrophy is more common. Reflexes in uh, Conus medullaris, uh, ankle reflex will be affected, whereas in cauda equina, both knee and ankle jerk will be affected. For conus medullaris, uh, the sensation will be lost in the perianal area, it will be symmetrical and bilateral, whereas for cauda equina, saddle area will be numb uh, and it will be asymmetrical and unilateral. In conus medullaris, uh, there will be early involvement of uh, uh, sphincter dysfunction presenting as urinary and fecal incontinence, whereas for cauda equina, sphincter dysfunction will uh, present at a later stage. Uh, impotency is frequently seen in uh, conus medullaris, whereas for uh, cauda equina, it is uh, less frequently seen. So, to conclude, uh, we'll be discussing about uh, two cases that we manage in our institution. So, first is Miss Yes, who's a 16 year old female who was treated outside and came in with complaints of right-sided upper limb and lower limb weakness for four months. Uh, she was referred for a bilateral uh, retroorbital pain, left ear pain, left upper limb and aching pain, and there was also blurring of vision present. While we did a physical examination, the prominent thing to note was that uh, in higher cortical function, patient uh, was having difficulty in speech fluency, mini cog examination, the score was just two. And in MMSC, patient had dyscalculia was present and agraphia was also present. In cranial nerve examination, cranial nerve two, patient had a uh, bilateral hem <coughs> hemianopia. In motor examination, 
for the tone, uh, the left upper limb and lower limb tone patient uh, was normal, whereas in the right side, the patient had a spasticity. And in the strength, uh, the left sided uh, patient had a score of four to five in all the motor strength examination, whereas in the right side, patient had a score of three by five. For the sensory examination, uh, patient had uh, abs absent proprioception and vibration sensations in the right upper limb and lower limb. The Binsky sign was positive in this patient, and uh, for the reflexes, the right side had an exaggerated reflex. Coordinations were all intact, and a gait was not elicited in this patient. Now, let's move on to questions. As we all discussed, Previously, let's summarize this via this case. Uh, for the level of the lesion, uh, where do you all think is the lesion? Was it upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron? They want to uh, want you to show the case scenario again. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, uh, it's an upper motor neuron lesion. Why it's an upper motor neuron lesion is because Babinski sign is positive, there's higher cortical functions involved, spasticity is present, and exaggerated reflex is present. So since it's an upper motor neuron lesion, where is the pathology? Is it in the cerebellum, brainstem, subcortical area, or the cerebral, uh, cerebral cortex? Where is the lesion? The patient presents with dyscalculia, agraphia, there's involvement of the optic nerve. Yes, it's a cerebral pathology. In the cerebral cortex, uh, since there, there was no loss of coordination, cerebellum is uh, ruled out. Uh, there's no involvement of cranial nerves from 3 to uh, 12, and hence brainstem is ruled out. Uh, higher cortical functions are uh, involved in this patient, and hence which rules in the cerebral pathology. Since the cortical pathology, where do you think is the level of the lesion? Frontal, parietal, temporal, or occipital? There's a a graphia was present, dyscalculia was present in this patient, and optic nerve was involved. Isha says parietal. Uh, which side is involved? Since the patient presented with all the features in the right side, the there was spasticity in the right side, exaggerated reflexes in the right side, the sensory uh, function was also affected in the right side. This suggestive of a We'll move on to the diagnosis. The patient had a left parieto-occipital space-occupying lesion. 
left side because everything was present on the right side for the patient. Parietal involvement because agraphy, acarpia, and apoxia was present. And occipital, uh, uh, occipital, uh, there was right uh, lateral hemianopia, and hence the occipital lobe was involved in this patient. So this is the last case. Uh, it is from, uh, of Mrs. P. She is a 46-year-old female with hypothyroidism as comorbid. She was diagnosed as carcinoma of left breast. Left MRM was done followed by adjuvant chemo and radiation and she was on tamoxifen. Four years later, she developed multiple metastases to lung, liver and bone. She was receiving letrozole and uh, uh, every three monthly hyaluronic acid and now she presented with complaints of bilateral lower limb weakness and mild sensory uh, loss. The physical examination in this patient, the higher cortical functions and the cranial nerves were intact. In the motor examination, patient had a normal tone. Uh, but uh, bilaterally in the lower limb, the patient had a score of uh, 4 by 5 in muscle strength in the plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Sensory and the pain and temperature and uh, proprioception vibration was intact, but the patient was having uh, this. Uh, inability to perceive sensation of light touch in the thigh area. The For the reflexes, the uh, Babinski sign was negative. And this is the reflexes. Uh, there was reduced reflexes uh, in the knee and the Achilles right? The coordination was intact in this patient. So the level of lesion, uh, why do you think it's a level of lesion in this patient? If it's upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. We have already answered LMN. Yes. Lower motor neuron. So if it's low, uh, why is it lower motor neuron? It's because it, it has a negative Babinski, normal higher functions, decreased reflexes present, and muscle strength is also redu reduced in this patient. If it's a lower motor neuron pathology, is it uh, anterior horn cell, roots, flexes, peripheral nerves, or muscle? Which one is involved in this patient? Anterior horn cell patient did have a sensory abnormality pre uh, present, which uh, rules out anterior horn cells. <clears throat> So in this patient, it it's the root that was involved. The patient had a radiculopathy. Sensory involvement rules out the anterior horn cells and uh, it was uh, symmetrical in nature which rules out the plexus or the peripheral nerve pathologies. It is a radiculopathy and the level of uh, root involved in this patient was L4 to L5 and L5 to S1. The patient had a disc bulge which uh, caused moderate central canal narrowing bilaterally. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nancy, uh, for the, the very clinical presentation. And I was very happy to see all the postgraduate uh, uh, registrars uh, typing away uh, the answers. Uh, so we are happy to answer any questions and uh, I'll also invite uh, comments from the senior faculty. Despite a very bad throat, uh, Nancy has done a very good job. <clears throat> so congratulations to you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. This is the time for the postgraduates to go about uh, typing questions or go, go, going about asking questions because this was very, very systematic uh, examination of the nervous system uh, going uh, from, uh, from the top to the per peripheral nerves. So uh, any questions, go ahead and ask. This is the forum. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi and Dr. Uh, uh, 
Chefrilla for making that uh, very, very succinct uh, present. Uh, at the same time, you made us made everybody realize that they can go through the cranial nerve examination so fast with that video. There's a question there, Meenakshi, you want to take it up? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so uh, the question from Dr. Tarun is, any specific suggestion on cranial nerve examination do we do for all the cases? So uh, I think uh, there it, it's, it's basically when you take the history itself, if you're going to find out that uh, there is bulbar involvement issues with breathing, speech, swallowing, then definitely uh, cranial nerve examination is indicated. And uh, like you saw in that video, Dr. Tarun, actually, uh, we were surprised to see, like, it, it took all of about uh, one and a half minutes to just do uh, this examination very quickly. So it, it would be worth the while if your history points you out to a bulbar involvement. So that you are clear whether it is from the cervical cord or is it from the uh, brainstem. So... Yeah, that's that's that would be my answer. Nancy, there's one more question. Differentiate between radiculopathy and direct cord compression with respect to physical findings, as discussed in case scenario two. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, if a uh, cord compression is present at the, at the level of the lesion, patient will be having a uh, upper motor neuron features would be present and. Below the cord compression, patient will be having lower motor neuron features. Whereas uh, radiculopathy, um, mainly it will be unilateral. But in this patient, since there is bilateral uh, narrowing of the canal, patient had a bilateral involvement. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any other questions, Meenakshi? No, ma'am. There are no questions. Anything else? Any any seniors want to add anything? Any yeah, comments? I think uh, there's one more uh, saying that uh, uh, by Dr. Tarun again to check sensory examination before uh, motor examination. Um, I think we just need to examine both. I mean, the order is your preference. As you talk to the patient, you'll have some idea uh, where uh, where this is heading. So you could use your discretion to do so. But both have to be examined. Otherwise, uh, you might miss uh, the findings. So it the is important point to note is you have to only look at pain and proprioception touch and the vibration sense just goes along with those tracks. So just two things to be tested very quickly. Thank you. I think the main take home from this was it is possible to do a neurological examination very fast, the cranial nerves very fast and go through systematically to, to be able to identify the lesion. If I, I, I don't think it will take more than 20 minutes to do a, a systematic neurological examination at the end of which you actually have a, a tentative diagnosis, then you can ask for the appropriate investigation. So that's the way to think about it rather than it's not a daunting uh, thought process at all the moment you get a neurological tip. Uh, that would be my take home point from this very clear class. Uh, uh, any, anybody else wants to add anything? Uh, it is 7.29. Archana, is that... Uh, yes, ma'am. Since there yeah. are no questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Jeffrila, Dr. Minakshi, and Dr. Kalpana. Uh, we invite you, the rest of you, to please join us next Monday. We will be discussing about uh, how to approach a patient with breathlessness in a palliative care setting. And this will be discussed by the Gujarat Cancer Research Institute team from Ahmedabad. Have a great week and we'll see you next week by before 6.30. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your patience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Archana.